So what I, what I wanted to do is situate the powers turn within the longer history of discussion of causality within American sociology. So I've been um, in American sociology for over a quarter century now. Um, and during that time, uh, the imagery that my colleagues used to describe causation shifted. When I entered graduate school in the late 1980s, the language of causal variables was the dominant one. Uh, by the time I earned tenure in the early 2000s, uh, the language of causal mechanisms had become the dominant language. Uh, now a few of us um, are wondering whether the language of causal powers might be preferable to the language of mechanisms. I, um, I expect that most or all of you will share my misgivings about the language of causal variable. Uh, for realist, the, the idea that a variable can be a cause is absurd on its face. Uh, indeed, I would argue that it doesn't even make sense from a properly positivist perspective. Uh, after all, there are no constant conjunctions between sociological variables and just statistical correlations. Uh, nor do probabilistic reformulations of variables language solve the problem. Correlations are not probabilistic uh, in the strict sense, um, at least not in social life, because probabilism refers to fixed probabilities of a given event, as in the case of a radioactive isotope. So there are no fixed constants of this sort um, in, in the social world, only variable correlations. Uh, by the turn of the millennium, a great number of American sociologists were beginning to feel uncomfortable with the language of causal variables. Some of them proposed that we speak of causal mechanisms instead. Uh, in the first reaction of a critical realist is this might be hallelujah. Uh, but uh, before we cheer, um, I think um, it's important to realize that there weren't many critical realists in American sociology at this time, and that uh, the turn towards mechanism was not uh, one that was brought about by critical realists. Rather, uh, mechanism language entered into U.S. sociology via another route, namely various forms of methodological individualism. Uh, the Franco-Canadian sociologist Raymond Boudon was one of the first to counterpose mechanisms to variables. He did so from an orthodox rational choice uh, perspective, and he would be followed by others in American sociology, such as Michael Hector and Edgar Kaiser of the University of Washington. Now, they generally thought of mechanism as the processes that connect variables. In other words, they were trying to synthesize a positivist language of variables with the realist language of mechanisms and processes. Uh, for them, um, uh, mechanisms really were just mediating variables. Orthodox rational choice theory had an enormous influence on American political science, but it did not have that much influence on American sociology. But this idea that mechanisms or processes or chains connecting variables is one that remains highly resonant amongst quantitative sociologists in the U.S. even now. Another source of mechanisms talk, a little closer to critical realism, was the heterodox version of rational choice known as analytical Marxism, or a bit more colloquially as no bullshit Marxism. <laughs> uh, the key figures here were John Elster and Adam Shaworski, uh, but Eric Olin Wright, my former colleague, uh, was also quite important here, though he was also influenced by Roy's version of critical realism. Uh, their main contribution, if it was one, was to use rational choice theory to address various empirical, empirical anomalies within traditional Marxism, for example, by showing how free riding could undermine class solidarity. Again, this movement did not exert much lasting impact on the discipline, but it did legitimize the use of mechanisms language by more qualitatively oriented sociologists uh, in fields such as political and historical sociology. A third and more recent source of mechanisms talk um, is the analytical sociology of Peter Hedstrom and his followers. Uh, to their credit, they do not regard mechanisms as mere supplements to variables. They regard them instead as a replacement. And on much the same grounds that we do, because they are committed to some form of realism. 
Laughs is a weak form of realism, uh, an ontological individualism, uh, which makes him highly suspicious of any kind of structural realism of the sort that most critical realists embrace. Uh, critical realists and analytical sociologists therefore tend to part ways over the question of social emergence. So hopefully you'll now see why I have rather mixed feelings about mechanisms talk in American sociology. Uh, the conversation so far has been framed and dominated by a motley crew of crypto-positivists, semi-positivists, and demi-realists. There's really not a full-fledged realist in the lot, much less a critical realist. But that's not really my only concern about mechanisms talk. Um, I'm not sure that the mechanism metaphor can really be salvaged um, because it has some rather problematic connotations. The paradigmatic example of a mechanism, which Dave has already invoked, is the mechanical clock. Uh, the me mechanism of a clock is composed of small, physically interconnected material parts that are hermetically sealed in a protective case and operate in a highly regular manner. Now, in truth, most social structures are just not that much like clocks. Uh, their parts, to begin, need not be small. Uh, on the contrary, they can be quite large. Think of a social class that is part of a mode of production or a nation state that is part of a world system. Nor need those parts all be physical. I think this might be one difference between Dave and myself. Um, this is not to deny that social structures have a material substrate, uh, nor uh, should we forget, importantly, that they have an artifactual dimension. I mean, this would be one, uh, I think the, the term artifactual is more useful or more precise uh, than, than material here, because most of the, the parts of social structures that we're talking about are artifacts in the philosophical sense, or things that have been purpose made by human beings. Uh, they're not just found objects. Uh, but social structures are also concept dependent uh, in the sense of state or a class partly exists in and through uh, its concept. And finally, the connections between the various parts of a social structure need not be physical ones either. Uh, they can be, as Dave rightly emphasized, intentional. You don't need to pick up a tax form or bump into a policeman in order for your actions to be oriented in some meaningful sense towards the state. Nor, of course, do most social structures operate as hermetically sealed systems. Um, indeed, one could argue that human reflexivity and cre creativity render the systemic closure of the social impossible, even in principle. But be that as it may, I think it's fair to say that open systems are the rule in the social world. Uh, lastly, whatever regularities that we observe in the social world are never more than what Tony Lawson calls demi-regularities. So systemic openness and human re reflexivity render the social world somewhat, if not wholly, unpredictable. Okay, by now, perhaps you're asking yourself why critical is ever became so enamored of the mechanisms concept in the first place. Uh, I think it's a fair question, uh, but it was better than the alternatives. Um, the social world certainly isn't law-like in the way that positivism requires, but it's not uh, random either, as idealistic version of social constructionism uh, imply. Think if societies, the interaction of mechanisms came closer to the truth of the matter. Also, the mechanisms idea did capture certain key tenets of critical realism. For example, the distinction between the real, the actual, and the empirical. Think of the clock example again. Um, one can, uh, uh, the mechanism is the real, the hands, the actual, our observation is empirical. One can observe the hands all day without understanding what makes them turn, and they will keep turning whether or not they're being watched. Finally, the mechanism's concept has the distinct advantage of bringing together structure and process in an intuitive way. <coughs> But I think that the powers concept um, has all of the advantage of the, of the mechanisms concept plus a few additional ones. To begin, the powers concept can easily accommodate all of these distinctions quite well. Uh, for instance, the demi-regular character of the phenomenal world can be understood in terms of the interaction between multiple and heterogeneous powers operating within an open system. And we can likewise imagine powers as real, but not actualized, and as actualized, but not observed. A powers ontology even allows for the existence of causal mechanism uh, as stable constellations of causal powers that operate in a predictable fashion. That is, we can think of causal mechanism as a subset or a special case uh, 
of causal powers. Finally, a powers ontology also allows one to combine structure and process in this, uh, in this intuitive way. A structure can be thought of as the bearer of a power, a process is the actualization of a power. Though um, I'm somewhat more agnostic, I think, than Dave is about whether we should have structures or powers, uh, some sort of ultimate metaphysical primacy. I think that you could embrace a powers, uh, a, a powered view of causation, and have powers be the, uh, be metaphysically primitive in your in your ontological system. But now I don't know. I, I think Dave is right to say that that's not terribly consequential for most social science. Which side you come down on? Um, what's more, uh, the powers concept has the further advantage that it allows another, a clear break with another dogma of empiricism, uh, namely what Ruth Groff has called passivism. Uh, by passivism, she means the notion that non-human life and or inanimate structures are essentially inert, that they have no tendencies or dispositions or powers of their own, that one can draw a fundamental distinction between matter and energy, uh, this is bad physics, as we know, and it, I think it's also bad metaphysics as well. Uh, when early modern science tossed Aristotelian physics out of the academy, it threw the baby out with the bathwater. In many ways, Aristotle's vision of a living cosmos full of powerful substances has ultimately proven more accurate than the reductionistic passivist materialism of early modern neo-Epicureans like Thomas Hobbes. In retrospect, the mechanisms concept actually starts to look like sort of a half halfway house between humanism and realism. And the powers concept allows us to get closer to a full-fledged realism. A further advantage of the powers concept from, uh, that follows from this one is that it allows critical realists to incorporate many important insights of assemblage theory and the new vitalism, but without accepting the Deleuzian demand for a flat ontology. For example, we can group Grant Bruno Latour's claims concerning actants or non-human agents, and we can also grant Jane Bennett's insistence on the vital powers of non-living things, but we do not need to accede to the further claim that there are no meaningful metaphysical distinctions to be made between human and non-human, the natural and the social, the animate and the inanimate. Nor do we need to give up on the idea that the world is ontologically stratified into analytically separable layers that are relatively autonomous from one another and to which correspond various special sciences. Nor finally do we need to accede to their assistance that causal analysis is a matter of empirical tracing of energy transfers through flat assemblages. Uh, we can retain a non-evaluative notion of ontological hierarchy that allows for downward causation. And I think it suggests methodologically that uh, our task is not to assemble the social. Uh, more often, it is to disassemble the social. That is, to analytically prize apart different sorts of social structures which overlap with one another and intersect with one another um, in space and time. So I think, you know, again, here, uh, Dave and I very much agree that one of, the, one of the peculiarities of social structures is that they are not spatio-temporally fixed in the same way that uh, the simple middle-sized object, material objects seem to be, um, and that we, then, we can therefore have social things that are, if not within social things, that are uh, partially overlapping with, with other, other social things in the way that uh, the Carter Business School is uh, an organization, a node in a network of organizations, um, and uh, space in a Bourdieuian social field, uh, amongst other things, and all of those things um, at the same time. Um, so let me just close by noting a couple of potential pitfalls that I think we have to be aware of in embracing the powers language. Um, there are some proponents of the powers view who are also committed to metaphysics of natural kinds and essences that I don't think translate, translates into the social sciences, if indeed it works even within the physical sciences. But the essentialist version of the powers view conceives of the physical world more or less on the model of the periodic table. There's a set, or at least a series of kinds, each with its corresponding powers and properties. Those kinds are typically understood more or less along the lines of Aristotelian substances, that is, as combinations of form and matter, and their powers along the lines of Aristotelian essences or intellect, that is, powers or dispositions. 
Now, such a view certainly cannot be extended to the social world, and for at least two reasons. First, because the social is heterogeneous. At a minimum, it consists of persons and objects and the relations between them. Second, because social structures do not comprise the closed set or simple theory. New structures and relations are constantly coming into being. And finally, because social properties and powers are often emergent, we'll never be able to draw up a comprehensive or exhaustive list of social essences or intellects either. This is not to deny that there are identifiable social kinds and powers in particular times and places. It's simply to insist that they are relational rather than essential. In other words, there are only kinds in relation and powers in relation, in relation to other structures and powers. And I suspect that the same is true of the physical world. Consider a simple question. Is water H2O? Well, yes, if you're thinking of water in relationship to the chemi chemical elements of the periodic table, uh, and if one is comparing its powers with H1 or O2, but not if one is thinking of water in relationship, say, to human bodies or culture, in which case the relevant powers of water are the power to quench thirst uh, or purify bodies. And so here, I think, actually, is one area where um, a true realism actually has to grant the, the sort of metaphysical heterogeneity uh, that, uh, that Deleuze actually insists on, even uh, without granting the flat ontology that he tries to impose on. So that's it.